Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to Rackham Graduate School. Uh, I'm Mike Solomon and I'm the Rackham Dean. I want to start out, uh, I'll be introducing the panelists in just a minute, but we have 8,500 Rackham students, uh, our graduate students uh, in Rackham. We have seven of them here and two of them are on crutches. So I don't know, <laughs> so I'm not sure what that says about our graduate education and what more to do. Maybe they can comment on that, but um, we're really delighted to have um, our panelists today and I'll be introducing them um, and we'll be getting going in just a moment. Um, thank you all for joining us for this, uh, for this event. It's, uh, it's really one of my favorite events of, of the year where we hear directly from uh, our, our graduate students. As University of Michigan President Mark Schlissel has said, graduate students are the heart and soul of the university. I want to echo that sentiment. I'm so excited to lead the graduate school as we build on the deep, rich foundation developed over the last century of graduate education at the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan conferred its first master's degrees in 1849 and awarded its first PhDs in 1876. And in fact, these were some of the first doctorates awarded at a university in the United States. Then in 1935, a bequest from Horace Rackham created an endowment that his widow, Mary Rackham, was instrumental in directing towards graduate student fellowships, research, and this building in which we're sitting right now. Her vision for this building and for the graduate school would be that it would be a center of interdisciplinary exchange on campus and student community. That vision still holds true, rings really true to me today. Rackham students come to Ann Arbor from across the world uh, and, and around the country. Their areas of study are even more varied. Rackham's more than 100 graduate programs cover nearly every aspect of scholarship in the humanities and the arts, the social sciences, the biological and health sciences, and physical sciences and engineering. Our students bring to campus a wide array of perspectives and interests that are essential to the diversity that makes our graduate school great. While many of our graduate students will pursue academic careers after completing their degrees, more than half will go into a wide and expanded variety of careers. Preparation for these diverse career paths equips, equips Michigan graduates with skills and flexibility for a rapidly changing job market. Graduate students seek to engage with companies, public and nonprofit agencies, community groups, professional associations, and entrepreneurial enterprises to develop their capabilities and learn how their research skills can make a difference in the world. No matter how varied their backgrounds or different their topics of inquiry may be, they share and benefit from the kind of exchange that this building is meant to offer and we are trying to promote here today. All of us at Rackham strive each day to build and expand an environment in which our students feel valued and welcomed, in which they engage in discovery, free inquiry, the open exchange of ideas, and the creation of knowledge. That is what graduate education is all about at Rackham. It's what promises it to be as we move forward uh, into our third century. I'm thankful for the chance as Dean to undertake this important work and to serve such a varied and academically vibrant community. I'm thankful for the outstanding staff, the excellent faculty, the generous alumni, and my devoted colleagues across campus who make our efforts possible. And most of all, I'm thankful for more than 8,500 Rackham students of Michigan who are giving and are shaping the vital issues of our day. Um, with us this morning are uh, seven outstanding students, maybe an eighth will join us, who are rigorous researchers and effective teachers. They are scholars who will collaborate across intellectual boundaries and engage in their communities. They'll tell us about their research and share their perspectives on being graduate students at Michigan. The students are each going to introduce themselves one at a time, and they're going to speak for about five minutes and then we'll open up the floor to uh, question and answers from you uh, um, after the last student has spoken. So with that, we're gonna start from the far end. Um, I'll ask uh, uh, Andrew uh, Cabanas to start us off. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm uh, ar an archeologist fundamentally at heart. Uh, that means that on some level, I kind of study communities. Uh, I study people, but I also study people who I can't really observe. Um, I study people who we don't really get to know in the way that we get to know each other. But we actually can learn a lot from archaeology that can help us understand uh, the world that we currently live in. One of the big questions for me that kind of drives a lot of my research here in the interdepartmental program in classical art and archaeology, which is the program I'm housed in between classics and art history, uh, is that uh, we really uh, can use archaeology to understand what makes communities unique. So think of what makes your hometown special. What do you remember about it? Is it the food? 
Is it the way people walk on the street? Is it the architecture? Is it the fact that maybe people there talk slightly differently? Whatever it is that makes you think of your hometown, it's probably a practice. It's probably a behavior that people do on a daily basis. And those types of practices are a combination of several different things. They're partly the types of things that people bring with them that they learned at home. You learn how to talk from your parents. You learn how to cook maybe from them as well. But they're also an element of innovation, something that gets brought together when a new group of people forms a new city, when a community changes over as generations pass. Thus, cities are a little bit chaotic. They're difficult to understand because they're constantly combining old and new things on a daily basis, recreating a communal identity that really affects the way that cities thrive as communities. Are they going to survive for centuries? Are they going to disappear within 70 years? Those are the sorts of questions which are really important if we want to understand modern cities and the real world that we live in, but are actually kind of hard to study in the modern day. We don't know what 100 years from now looks like. So if we want to try and understand modern cities, actually our best data set for this is the past. And that's why I'm an archaeologist, is because I work on studying ancient cities to build models to understand modern ones. My own research mostly focuses on households in ancient Greece, uh, which is a really great place for studying cities because people have been working there for a very long time. We have literary sources, we have hundreds of years of archaeology, which have uncovered hundreds of cities, thousands of houses, and in that way we can actually reconstruct individual ways of life. How do individual households decide to cook their food? How did they make the clothes that now we don't think so much about that we wear, but each of us is wearing thousands, well, thousands of meters, miles of thread that would have taken months to weave in the ancient world? So really, these are two fundamental things, making sure that you have food to eat and making sure you have clothes to wear that were the most time-consuming tasks for most of human history. And partly through support from Rackham, as well as through the International Institute, the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology, um, and some of the professional societies that I'm a part of, I've been able to go around through Greece and study some of these early cities that we have there and better understand the exact way that individual behaviors give rise to community identities. Um, so I want to bring just in two very brief examples just to show kind of the types of work that I do. Um, so on the one hand, this summer um, I spent some time in Athens, a little bit of time in northern Greece near Thessaloniki, uh, reconstructing the way that people used cooking pottery. Just in the same way that you, when you stir sugar into your tea or coffee in the morning, your, that spoon leaves little traces in the bottom of the mug that maybe over a few years you notice build up. Those same types of traces build up on everything you use in daily life, including the cook pots that you might use. Particularly when they're made of ceramic, it's really easy for somebody who knows what they're looking for to tell exactly how they were used. And that means that I can now trace differences in the way that maybe people in northern Greece are choosing to fry their food, whereas people in central Greece near Athens are choosing to boil it. And that can tell us important things about maybe why they're doing that and where those traditions come from. On the other hand, I've also spent several years now, about seven, working in eastern Crete um, in a set of small villages that were occupied between about 3,000 and 2,500 years ago where we can trace individual households and the way that they move across the landscape with, and their types of textile technologies that they bring with them. Why do they choose to make the cloths that they wear in that exact way? By looking at the tools, measuring them, we can understand exactly how and when innovation arises. And one of the things that we find is that while people in small villages that are near each other may have very similar ideas about how to produce clothing, all of a sudden when they come together to form a city, there's a lot more inequality apparent. Some people keep making basic fabrics, but some people don't have to anymore. Some people have so much wealth that they can spend their time making very elaborate tapestries, things that will never be functional in the way that a piece of clothing will, but show off the skill of the person using it. And that's something that could really only be cultivated if they had the wealth to know that they could buy their clothing on the market. So by tracing these differences through little case studies like these, we can actually build up a sense of how these types of things move in the modern world. We can understand why people move to suburbs, what types of lifestyle choices make them move there, what type of ways of life bring people back into cities. And it's by building up these models that we're actually going to develop the science of cities that I think we're currently on the verge of developing um, and is currently a major topic of research. And as, we continue, as I continue to develop this research and present it at conferences here at the University of Michigan as well as across the United States, or this last year I was presented at one in Germany, uh, really, it's the support of the graduate program that makes sure that trying to do this cutting-edge research is really going to happen in the way that it should so that we can understand the types of communities that we live in today.
Thank you. Good morning. My name is Pauline Crouch, um, and I am a fifth year in mechanical engineering. Those diseases that medicines do not cure are cured by the knife. Those that the knife does not cure are cured by the fire, and those that fire do not cure must be considered incurable. Hippocrates in 370 BC made the first recorded mention of the use of heat as a therapeutic. To this day, the effect of temperature on the body is of interest to clinicians, researchers, athletes, and perhaps anyone that has had to live through a Georgia summer or a Michigan winter. <laughs> the body maintains temperature homeostasis by the process of thermoregulation. Just like Goldilocks, our body doesn't want to be too hot or too cold. The body's ability to thermoregulate is an important coping mechanism to withstand various physiological states, such as fever, and environmental exposure, exposures, such as weather. The cardiovascular system in particular plays a vital role in thermoregulation because of its influence on heat transfer via forced convection and conduction through changes in blood distribution, blood velocity, and proximity of tissues. It remains unclear how the allocation of blood in various compartments, such as the innermost core, the fat, the muscle, or the skin, changes with temperature. Challenges in measuring core vasculature have resulted in a lack of empirical information regarding how it might change with core temperature. Therefore, to fully understand the cardiovascular system's role in thermoregulation, my thesis has worked, focused on using urine models to study the effect of temperature on core vasculature. The overall purpose of my research is to provide a novel and physiologically accurate approach to studying thermoregulation by incorporating structural and functional changes in the cardiovascular system occurring in the core. The hope is that this research can help researchers, clinicians, and others interested in the effect of temperature to better model and predict cardiovascular outcomes. So how do we use small animal models, such as mice and rats, to study how the cardiovascular system changes? The answer, a multi-million dollar magnet. Although historically, preclinical MRI studies of the cardiovascular system have been focused on pathological diseases, such as deep vein thrombosis, which is also studied in our lab, I was given the unique opportunity at the University of Michigan to create my own research plan, funded in part by Rackham Research Grants, a Rackham Summer Award, and a Rackham Merit Fellowship. And I get to use this ultra-high field seven Tesla magnet to answer some fundamental questions regarding thermoregulation and bioheat. For our thir first three papers, we anesthetized the mice and imaged the animals while, while monitoring respiration and heart rate. We use a PID controlled heater to blow hot air across the animals and we can control the core temperature from mild hypothermia to mild hyperthermia. At each temperature we image three or four locations of the body from head to toe and we can quantify blood flow, uh, vessel area and measure strain of the carotid artery, the jugular vein, the aorta, the infrarenal vena cava and the femoral artery and veins. Overall we have shown that with temperature, increases in flow occur in most arteries and veins, which is opposite to current hypothesis regarding the venous response. We have shown that the magnitude of increased flow varies based on anatomical location, and that the increase in flow is sometimes involves cross-sectional area and velocity, and other times involves only one or the other. A future incorporation of core cardiovascular changes into modeling is important because blood flow is critical in heat generation and in transfer in vivo. My hope is that my work positively influences many areas of science and engineering, from designing improved and personalized spacesuits to better understanding thermoregulation in the elderly who do not t uh, tolerate temperature deviations as well, to designing better therapeutic protocols for critical care, and to potential consequences of climate change on the human condition. Not only have I been able to publish on this work and other collaborations from the lab, I have also been able to attend many conferences around the world because of Rackham's conference travel grants and other travel awards. I have been able to meet astronauts at the International Astronautical Congress in Guadalajara, learn from top researchers in the field at a resort in Cancun, as well as explore different research topics at the World Congress of Biomechanics in Ireland. All of this would not be possible without Rackham's support. 
I've also been fortunate to serve on the Rackham Student Government Board and have been the Vice President for the past year and a half. I've learned so much about how the university works and I feel honored to be able to represent graduate students at all levels of the university. As much as I've learned about how people tolerate or do not tolerate temperature in the lab, my experiences as Rackham Student Government Vice President has taught me so much more and my graduate experience would not be as fulfilling without Rackham Student Government or Rackham Graduate School. I am grateful for all that Rackham has done to support my graduate career. Hello. Um, so my name is Cecilia Morales. I'm a PhD candidate in the English Language and Literature Department. Um, and before I start, I want to just mention, because I, I wrote a statement and did not um, focus so much on this in the statement, <clears throat> that I receive a lot of funding from Rackham. Um, I'm currently a Rackham Merit Fellowship. Um, and I, as I was last year and my first year of graduate school, um, I also received conference funding from Rackham and um, I've participated in a lot of Rackham programs, um, specifically the Rackham program in public scholarship. Um, I've done a lot of initiatives through that and so I'd be happy to answer questions about that later. Um, so. When I tell people outside of humanities fields that I work on the early modern period, there's generally some confusion about when exactly this period occurs. The early modern period generally sp spans from the late 15th century to the 17th century, which may not seem particularly modern to most people. Shakespeare, um, the only writer covered in my dissertation who people consistently know, um, feels especially foreign to most people who have only vague memories of struggling through his kind of old-timey prose in high school English classes. In fact, the early modern period is synonymous with Renaissance, which literally means rebirth, um, from rebirth, in reference to the period's revival of classical ideas. In my dissertation, I use both early modern and Renaissance, depending on whether I want to emphasize the continuity between the 17th century and today, or the differences between us and them. If you're using the word Renaissance, um, that's a way of emphasizing the period's relationship to what came before it. Um, using early modern is a way of emphasizing the period's similarities to our moment right now. I believe that it is crucial to do both and to hold both those perspectives in tension. Um, so that's kind of my uh, thesis for this talk, um, and I'll come back to that later. So informed by feminist theory, critical race theory, and queer theory, my dissertation demonstrates the role of maternity in shaping broad cultural values in the 17th century, including religious norms, racial paradigms, and sexual stereotypes. I trace the rhetorical function of maternity within English literature during a pivotal century in English history, a century that witnessed the effects of the Protestant Reformation, the English Civil War, and the beginnings of English colonial expansion and the transatlantic slave trade. In order to understand the high stakes of maternity during this century, it's important to note the great deal of pressure that was placed on women's reproductive capacities, as well as the concerns this pressure raised about the fragility and corruptibility of women's bodies. Scholars estimate that as many as one in 20 women died during childbirth at this time. Even if both the mother and the child survived birth, um, the infant mortality rate was also very high. Um, so women's um, the way that women cared for their newborns was highly scrutinized. Despite the dangers and stressors, <clears throat> stressors, most women seemed to expect to become mothers. The cultural pressure to give birth was especially high for upper class women, as you might expect, um, because they needed to produce heirs, especially male heirs, um, to pass on the family name and property. Indeed, the practical need to control mothers' roles um, to control the flow of resources and power between generations via patriarchal inheritance made mother's roles, on the one hand, very powerful and important, and on the other hand, very nerve-wracking. Men were afraid not only that women were going to cheat on them, so what the period um, called cock-holding, um, 
but also that they were going to physically corrupt or even kill the child in their womb. This latter set of fears was exaggerated by early modern scientific theories, um, so science prior to the development of empirical science in the late 18th century was based on Galenic humoral theory, which posited that bodies are made up of four substances called humors, um, which needed to be constantly regulated. So this is why like bloodletting was a, was a popular um, treatment for basically everything in the period, or leeching. Um, Bodies were subject to constant manipulation from the outside world, and mothers' bodies, in particular, were thought to be incredibly vulnerable to environmental influence and therefore dangerous to infants. There was this really wacky theory called maternal impression um, that basically said that whatever mothers focus on, either um, visually or physically, um, when they were pregnant, could end up altering the child at birth. So there's this famous story from a text called Aristotle's Masterpiece um, of a white woman who looks at pictures of black Moors, which was a term that they used to describe um, North African Muslims with dark skin. Um, so she looked at a picture of a black Moor and then ended up giving birth to a black baby and it was blamed on the um, maternal impression because of course the father was white and what else could what else could happen um, in the interim. So uh, while the logic of this story seems ridiculous to us now, this was a period before paternity tests, before empirical science, and before an understanding on how traits like skin color are passed on via DNA. It's also a great example of the influence of ideas about maternity on the development of ideas about race. In Aristotle's masterpiece, a preconceived understanding of how maternal bodies work is used to make sense of a new problem, that problem being a lack of understanding about how skin color is reproduced. As the English began to explore North Africa and witness the spread of, of the Islamic Ottoman Empire, a fear of weakening racial and religious boundaries demanded new theories about human differences, and maternity was available to offer an explanation. The moral of the story from Aristotle's masterpiece is that women need to be careful because it's their actions, not their biology, that determine their offspring's race. Um, so that was just one theory that was in competition with some other competing theories um, about how race is reproduced. So while we may no longer believe in the theory of maternal impression, our society does still feel the residual effects of this belief today. The effects of essentialized racism was used to justify slavery and continues to underlie institutionalized racism today. Furthermore, our culture continues to put pressure on women to maintain the sexual integrity of our society, a fact that I think is particularly coherent as of last week with the Kavanaugh hearings, um, as well as other times throughout history. Returning to my thesis that this period should be viewed as both similar and different from our current moment, I believe it is by having the mindset of early moderns, a mindset that is very different than our own, that we are able to better observe the contours of our own cultural biases. Furthermore, my work posits the centrality of maternity and maternal bodies to historical events that continue to have a global impact today. My dissertation sketches one of the avenues through which our current ideas about religion, race, and sexuality developed over time. I believe that by teaching our students to step outside of themselves, we can help them to reflect on their own values and assumptions. Educating students on how our cultural biases develop around and through women's bodies is an important strategy for overcoming those biases and producing positive change. everybody. Hi. My name is Shama and I'm a fifth year PhD student in molecular, cellular and developmental biology. And while that seems like quite a mouthful, what that means is I study very, very small things um, all the time. Um, so the Department of Molecular, Cellular and Developmental Biology, MCDB, um, uses model organisms to understand basic things about all of us, so basic biology. And um, in my lab, and my dissertation uh, focuses on using the fruit fly as a model organism. And I'll explain uh, in a second why fruit flies are really, really important. Um, so just like everybody else, uh, I 
I have been supported by Rackham throughout my education here. And this year, I just started um, my fellowship as a barber fellow, which, uh, for which I'm very grateful. Um, so I use the fruit fly as a model organism. Fruit flies can tell us a lot about our own biology, um, even though they're quite annoying. And if you want to ask me the best way to get rid of fruit flies, I'll be happy to tell you later. Um, <laughs> Because that's, that's the most important thing, right? How do you, how do you get rid of them? Right? So um, most cells in our body are not dividing. And in, but how cells make the decision to stop dividing and stay non-dividing is very, very poorly understood. And this is the focus of the research in my lab. And um, we study this in many different ways. And I use the fruit fly brain to try and understand how cells in our body stop dividing and what happens with age when um, the ability to stop or stay undivided becomes compromised. And um, while this seems uh, esoteric and may not be relevant to everybody, it's important to know that the biggest cause for uh, or risk factor for cancer is age and the biggest risk factor for neurodegeneration is age and we're trying to use the fruit fly to understand how this happens because fruit flies age within 60 days you don't have to wait three years as you would with a mouse or 80 years as you would with a human to try and understand what happens with age so um, fruit flies have very easy to understand biology and it's been well studied for over a hundred years and they have a really good well mapped genome so when we have five or six copies of a gene, fruit flies usually just have one copy. And we share 50% of the same genes with fruit flies. So it's much easier to make mutations in a fruit fly and ask what happens and try to translate that rather than to do that with uh, human cells and culture. Um, so aside from the research I do in the lab, uh, about which I'd like to talk more interactively, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'm also a, a GSI and I've served as a, a graduate student instructor and a graduate student mentor for several terms at the University of Michigan. And um, I'm also very passionate about teaching science and doing a lot of science outreach. And uh, in the long term, I'd like to take all of the education I got here at the University of Michigan back to my home country, India, and help develop basic biological science institutes in India um, where there are not very many of. So um, thank you to Rackham for organizing this event. And um, uh, as everybody mentioned, you know, they get to go to a lot of conferences. I too have been able to attend a lot of conferences all over the world with the help of Rackham. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone here for that. Good morning, how are you doing? Uh, first, thank you so much for being here and thank you for Rackham and for Dean Mike Solomon for organizing this and I'm excited to be here with some colleagues and friends to kind of talk to you all today. Um, so I'm Gordon Palmer, I'm a fifth year PhD student and the, or candidate in the Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education, which is also the Higher Education Program. Um, and so before I hop into my research, I'll tell you a story of how I come, how I come to the research, right? Um, so I think it's important, particularly for my research, to understand stories. Um, uh, I came to the United States when I was 12. I came from a little island country of Jamaica, which you probably all understand and know. Uh, it's a paradise, but it's also a place of incredible um, suffering sometimes, right? Uh, so I, come to this, I came to the States, to Texas, when I was 12. And upon landing, I was almost assaulted by the differences here. Uh, I didn't understand how to function, what it meant to be a person in the United States, and uh, growing up, I had questions about what citizenship meant. What, is it, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to function in a democracy? Uh, what does it mean to kind of move and change and hope for change in the political system? So uh, with those thoughts, I went to college and I majored in religion and, and political science. because so I found that for many people, religion influenced the ways that we thought about politics and then um, those politics and that spirituality kind of influenced the way they then worked and changed democracies, or at least, at least it changed the way they tried to participate. So, uh, but alongside that, I noticed that in college, uh, universities are charged with creating citizens, right? Every mission statement says, we are here to create citizens or 
we are here to create active participants in democracy. And I often wondered what does it actually mean and how does that actually come to bear on the lives of students. And so in college, I participated in a few organizations and events, and I was that typical over-involved undergrad who didn't get paid for anything, wouldn't sleep, but still maintained a good GPA most of the time. <laughs> Thank God that didn't translate to my, my Rackham time. Um, so because of all those things, I really kind of asked questions around how does spirituality and religion um, and gender connections to other people, how do, how do those connections then affect the way we think about democracies and, and republics, and then how does that then influence those that we seek to change through varying civic engagement and democratic action, how does that kind of spur us on to change our political systems? So I come to these big questions based mostly on my life experience, right? But for so many of us, that's kind of what we do. We study the things that we observe in the world. So in thinking about those questions, I come to our education to kind of find out just how colleges and universities serve as crucibles in which these things happen. And, and right now, in particular, it's a fun moment for me because you see across the nation, we see an uprising of um, access moments, right? We see spurs of it, and particularly here. Uh, and I'll talk about that a bit more later, my involvement there. Um, well, other right now. So at Rackham, I have been able to um, be involved in a variety of organizations, one being the Students of Color of Rackham. Uh, and in my roles there have uh, served as sometimes agitator, um, sometimes colleague and friend. Uh, and in that experience, I've been able to kind of see just how spirituality and activism come together uh, and how those two things interact and intersect to kind of spur political change. And so my dissertation addresses those questions, right? How does spirituality um, in the lives of college students influence the ways that they then pursue change in their democracies? And I think college is a really important space for that to happen. In, a, in, a, in more kind of tangential ways, my research also to undertake spirituality as a cultural strength in black Americans and seeks to understand how spirituality influences uh, the care for children in black fathers, how spirituality helps influence persistence and resilience for black men in STEM, and how uh, spirituality serves as a protective factor when people of color encounter race and racist acts. And so that kind of, kind of spans the boundaries there. Um, the reason I can do this research though is because the university is a place with very low walls and students are able to kind of interact with varying departments quite readily and are supported to do so and to kind of broaden their interests pretty readily. So I'm, I've been very fortunate in higher education uh, to have mentors who have pushed me to explore literatures and exper experiments and studies in other fields and bring those into my work here. Uh, I've also been very, very fortunate in that I've been supported with that through scholarships from Rackham and from other departments, along with being supported by this really, really good mentorship. Uh, not only from professors, but from uh, folks in Rackham, and that's been a blessing and a pleasure to kind of under, to both take up and to kind of explore. Uh, the implications for my work are many, and I think very varied. Uh, first, we, I think right now, uh, colleges and universities are under a bit of attack, right? Um, as places of reinforcing particular ideologies, and I think it's important to explore what those actually are and then kind of name those and put those into the public space that we can debate uh, and engage democratically and not engage uh, in a dichotomous debate. We should, I think we have a, a very nuanced and varied understanding of the university. We should be able to kind of discuss that publicly. I also have implications for thinking about the ways that we train uh, scientists in STEM and thinking of a more holistic process for admission, retention, and persistence of people of color in STEM fields, along with understanding ways that we can intervene in low-income neighborhoods, particularly among black parents. Um, yeah, and I'm really excited about the work. I'm really thankful for being here, and thank you again, Rackham, and all the folks here for sponsoring this event today. Marissa Schmidt, and I am actually a postdoc here um, with the Firearm Safety Among Children's and Teens Consortium. Um, I just recently completed my PhD in the School of Public Health in Health Behavior and Health Education. Um, and my training, I am an adolescent um, development researcher. I have, I started studying adolescent development um, and 
I studied it from a perspective of the of a resiliency perspective and a positive youth development perspective. I found that as I was reading the literature, a lot of what we know about adolescent development is from a very negative um, perspective. A lot about risk factors um, and s thinking of youth as problems to be solved. Um, adolescence as a period of storm and stress. And that didn't sit well with me. And so when I started reading about resilience theory um, and this idea of positive youth development, um, I became interested in thinking about what are the positive factors in youth's lives that can um, send them on a positive trajectory. So we know that youth face adversities and yet there are youth that um, are able to positively develop whereas there are also youth that um, may not do so as um, successfully. And so I wanted to start studying what it is that can put youth on that positive tra uh, trajectory. And um, when I first got here as an MPH student, I was interested in understanding a little bit more about this idea of future orientation and future expectations. And I, and I studied contextual factors that influenced future expectations among youth and how that, um, how that impacted youth outcomes, including um, bullying behavior, aggression, aggression um, and youth violence in, in general. Um, and that led me to study other positive factors. And I transitioned when I started my dissertation to this concept of mattering. I had happened upon the literature on mattering um, as I was studying for my preliminary exams, and it spoke to me. And Rosenberg identified these two different types of mattering, and there's interpersonal mattering and then societal mattering. And no researchers had studied societal mattering, and there had been quite a bit of literature on this idea of interpersonal mattering, which is um, how much you feel that you are important to those who are closest to you, specific others in your lives. And then societal mattering is this idea of how much do I matter to society? How much do I feel as though I actually make a difference in this world? And that hadn't been studied. And so I spent my time on my dissertation um, developing a measure to, um, to measure this, this construct. And I was fortunate enough to receive funding from Rackham to be able to um, do primary data collection and I studied this concept, mattering, among rural youth. And um, what I was able to do is I developed a, a, a survey measure, and I looked at con different contextual factors across the school, the community, um, and then within the family, and among friends. So I looked at different levels of factors and how those influenced the, um, both interpersonal and societal mattering. And then I, I looked at, okay, so does mattering have important implications for adolescent outcomes? And I looked at nonviolent delinquency, um, substance use, and um, violence. And I found that mattering has a very important role in these adolescent outcomes, but we didn't really under, I, I, I needed to know more. And so I studied the mechanism by which these two different types of mattering impact um, youth violence and substance use and nonviolent delinquency. And found that youth who have a sense of societal mattering are more likely to be civically engaged in their communities and to feel like, okay, since I matter to society and since people believe that I can make a difference in the world, then they are more likely to go out and do so. And that is what protects them against um, negative outcomes. For people that feel that they matter um, very specifically to those closest in their lives, uh, go through this self-regulation and feel like, I don't want to let those people in my life down, and so I'm going to be less likely to engage in negative behaviors that may disappoint these people. So these two types of mattering are important to study separately um, because they have the, the mechanism by which they um, protect youth from negative outcomes are different. Um, and so now I'm taking what I've learned from my dissertation and I am applying it in my work um, with youth gun violence. 
And so we are currently in the stages of putting together um, pilot projects to study this mechanism of mattering specifically with youth gun violence. And the first step that I will be taking is looking at mattering in relation to um, suicide by firearm among youth 0 to 17. Um, and just figuring out if, if this is a, um, a factor in the lives of youth that we can develop programs to enhance. Um, and my ultimate career goal would be to implement youth-led, fully youth-led programs to enhance youth's perceptions of mattering um, as a way of protecting them against negative outcomes and um, supporting them in positive outcomes. So I'd be happy to talk more about that um, in the Q&A. Good morning. My name is Kara Palmer. I am a fifth year doctoral candidate in the School of Kinesiology. I work in the Child Movement Activity and Developmental <coughs> Health Lab. Um, and the big premise of our lab is to help young children start out their lives on positive developmental trajectories of health. And we do this in several ways, but the biggest way that we do this work is we're actually interventionists. So we spend a lot of our times in local schools and in local Head Start centers actually implementing movement interventions to help promote children's um, anthropometrics, so their BMI, their weight, uh, their body composition, their weight, their motor skills, how well they move, their physical activity, how much they move, their perceived motor competence, so how well they think they move, um, and then also we look at other things like their self-regulation and their early academic achievement. So the bulk of this work centers around one intervention in particular. It's called the Children's Health Activity and Motor Program, the CHAMP program. We are currently in year two of a five-year randomized control trial looking at the um, intervention effects of CHAMP, the longitudinal study. So we work with approximately 300 children in Ypsilanti um, looking at how this intervention is going to or impact their health longitudinally. I think it's pretty cool work. Um, we do also other work in our lab. We have some yoga interventions. We have some other movement interventions that we're looking at. My dissertation in particular is interested in not only how does this intervention work, but why does this intervention work? And so CHAMP is what we call a high autonomy intervention. And if anybody ever has had young children or worked with young children, try to envision this. You've got 30 young children in a room. You've got three stations, and you say, go. And they go. Um, and it's really an interesting phenomenon because they self-organize, they pair up in their own groups, they go to the stations to learn the skills that they want to learn, they spend time where they want to spend it, and then we act as facilitators to help them navigate through this climate. And it's one of the reasons this intervention has been shown to help self-regulation in this population. And so I'm really interested in understanding, well, what's happening within that intervention that promotes these positive health outcomes? And the reason I'm really interested in that is if we can understand what happens within, maybe we can start to build better, more time, and more cost-effective interventions that work for very specific populations. So for instance, in the work that we do, um, and again, if any of you guys have ever worked with young kids or spent time with them, we find that girls are often less skilled than boys. And so the question is, well, how do we help these girls catch up with their peers so that they can have healthy trajectories, particularly in weight in girls it's a problem and in physical activity across the lifespan. And so that's what my work kind of centers on. And so as part of this work, um, when you work with preschoolers, you have the prime hours of 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. every day with which you can get all of your work done. And so I'm very grateful to Rackham for their financial support. So they've helped support me to be able to do that work and relieve me of my GSI duties. Um, because without that, I simply couldn't be <laughs> in two places at once. Um, and moreover, we work at three different centers. And so Rackham has also helped, helped me to hire and train people to be at centers when I can no longer be there. And so it gives a wider impact of our work. Um, one of the neat things about the work that I do and I, and I particularly love about um, my research, but it's great to hear about all this other research as well, is I like the translational approach. So we do follow these kids for years. We get very close personal relationships with the children, with the teachers, with the schools. Um, and we actually have nice real world benefits to the work that we do. That being said, my ultimate career goal is to take 
the programs that we develop and start to change them from research-led programs to practitioner-implemented programs so that they're no longer dependent on a research team coming in, but rather they can be implemented by the community themselves. And so as I transition out of my um, graduate student career and into my next <laughs> endeavor, um, whatever that will be, I'm, I'm working with my mentor, Leah Robinson, and other, other members of the lab to try to translate our program into a, um, into a curriculum that can be used without us being there. So thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be at this event. I'm happy to chat more about my work or anything else. I'm excited to learn more about the panel's work as well. It's very cool. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Wow, I mean, each one of you is uh, really impressive to hear, but to hear all of you together, uh, you know, we're so grateful to uh, have the opportunity to support you in the work that you're doing. Uh, we have uh, plenty of time for discussion now, so uh, I'd like to open up uh, uh, to questions from the audience. And I see we have one, and we'll be off to the races. So please go right ahead. Thank you. Um, you, I think, have all acknowledged um, the contributions that some of us here have made to, um, to your education. We thank you very much for that. Um, uh, but I would tell you that I think most of us are here today to acknowledge you and to recognize you and to be impressed by you and the projects that you've undertaken as part of your PhD. And I have to tell you, you've really succeeded. <laughs> uh, I think this is, um, I, I'm a PhD from um, Michigan in um, what you would call, uh, Clarissa, the, probably the late Middle Ages, uh, <laughs> 76. but. Um, uh, you have certainly reinforced my conviction that um, I couldn't get admitted today to the school that I graduated from. Uh, but your, your projects, it seems to me, all have a kind of future, futurist orientation. Uh, you're doing something, working on something, which is going to improve lives in a very specific way uh, for people who are coming after you. and. And, and your peers. Um, and I wonder if you could maybe just, um, I, sort of not everybody, but uh, ruminate somewhat on um, what those dreams are like. Uh, what is it that you really uh, would like to, um, how would you like to transform the world? Uh, and um, how you kind of sustain that optimism uh, for uh, as many years as you can uh, and um, actually make it, uh, make it happen. Thank you for such an easy and low stakes question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, w one thing is that the, we have the knowledge, or certainly in my, in my PhD program, I feel that other people, I, I have the social support of other people who have gone through the same process, the same process of finding an idea, of recognizing that it has applicability beyond the field it was originally a part of. Um, and actually, I would say that um, a lot of it is the social community, that institutions like Rackham, like the Kelsey Museum, like Rackham work groups, things like that can create, actually helps you with a lot of the, oh, hey, it's not just what I'm writing on the page. There is a bigger world out there. There is a social community I'm a part of. That's certainly part of what keeps me going every day and part of the reason I'm able to maintain thoughts like this. Karen? Oh, I think, I think for me, my, my personal goal is to help children enter school healthy and ready to learn. And especially children who come from at-risk at environments, so children from low SES homes or, or backgrounds where they don't have as much. Um, and so I think for me, trying to maintain that optimism, it's, it's a struggle some days when the kids are going everywhere. Um, but I think one of the great things about Rackham, and I think all of us have mentioned, are the conferences. And so through that, I've, I actually have a nice, I have a great support system at Michigan and then throughout the country and throughout the globe that really there's more than one person working on this problem. And, and I have, you know, close friends in Canada and Australia and we'll text and we'll call when we get discouraged and it kind of helps to keep us uplifted and keep us going and we kind of all have share the same, same vision. So that's kind of how I approach that. 
I would just like to add that I think um, my main goal with my research is to push back against the stereotypes and the misconceptions about youth. Um, and what keeps me going towards that effort is feel, uh, being able to work with youth uh, as often as I can in different um, types of settings as volunteer, substitute teaching, what, however I can interact with the youth, uh, with youth. And um, I also think, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but um, I, the, the, my ultimate goal is to never read an article a, a news article about, um, and I don't know if you're familiar, but there was a, a mayor in Kentucky who spoke out about youth that were um, fighting against young, uh, gun violence in their schools, and he made a quote to a local newspaper about these youth just want attention. They have no idea what they're talking about. They don't even understand uh, this, this issue. And I never want to read something like that again. And so that's what motivates me to continue this fight. Okay. One over here. We have a mic we're sending around. Thanks. Yeah, was it? Yeah, um, it was funny. Uh, as Chris has stopped speaking, I like turned to Chris like, "That's what you do. That's really, really cool." Um, because I, I think so much of the work at this table is aimed at kind of like getting rid of luck. Um, because I think a lot of us up here uh, often say we're so lucky, right? We're so lucky we've made it. Um, and I think a lot of us are trying to get rid of luck. We're trying to um, have societies that are open and accessible and equitable. And I think that string uh, kind of, I would, can I speak for you on this? Yeah, okay. Kind of aligns some of, some of the work at this table, right? Um, Andrew's work, like speaking towards equitable cities and, and getting this there, right, aligns some things I'm doing. And so I think um, that, that thought is very well placed and that I think we're all trying, at least in some way, shape, or form, to kind of get rid of luck and kind of have a world that is very equitable and just. That all of our work is about empowering um, individuals. So with empowering um, individuals to study science in India, um, empowering youth to um, contribute to their community and feel as though they matter. Um, but I'm just kind of curious um, how you might see our, our lines of work coming together. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right back up. <laughs> we don't have to. It's a Venn diagram with three circles, yeah. and I felt they were all coming together in a way. Um, although if you defined your spirituality or if you gave us the, the uh, project of what mattering is, it might sound very different. I, do other people share that idea or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sir, right. yeah. Is everybody, are you able to hear the question in the back? No, okay. So, um, do, you want, do you mind repeating the question before you, before um, you dive in? He asked in? me yeah. if I see my work connecting with the Me Too movement today. Um, I think in a lot of ways, part of my um, drive within pedagogy um, is to encourage my students to learn how to... Um, like evaluate sources to be critical. Um, so in this era of fake news um, and um, kind of like, I think is like a total collapse of um, like intelligent discourse um, at large. So I think part of what um, 
you know, studying literature, studying English, um, studying writing and discourses is learning how to like evaluate um, sources. Um, thinking particularly about, you know, women's bodies in the way um, that I do. The Me Too movement is not one that I like have thought particularly about connections because my work doesn't um, concern sexual violence in particular. Um, but it does often touch on um, thinking about kind of the dubiousness of consent in the early modern period. Um, so in the science, they believed that um, they believed that if a woman got pregnant, that um, that was evidence that she was not in fact raped because the woman had to release her seed as well um, because the model of the woman's body was paralleled to the man's so that the woman was basically um, an undeveloped man. So the organs were literally um, just like flipped inside of her um, was the idea. So that had like weird implications for um, consent. Um, and so, and I think, you know, that idea is still present in our, um, you know, in our moment today, this idea that like, women, um, you know, somehow, somehow are at fault. Um, even like, I don't know, who is that? There was some senator that made some comment about this recently, <laughs> about like, don't women's body, don't women have ways of shutting this down, um, right? Um, so I think, yeah, absolutely, the implications are there. Um, and thinking about you know, putting that in context of this is, you know, these are ideas that come from, like, you know, Galen or Galen, you might know how to pronounce that better than I do, <laughs> is, I think, definitely a way to, to speak to that. So. Sir? My question is for Shaya. If I'm pronouncing it right, but anyway. But basically, uh, there's a medical doctor, Dr. Fossil, F O S S E L. And uh, he's studying uh, telomeres and uh, how the telomeres has to do with aging, you know, in a way. And there's a product currently listed as a nutraceutical, and it's sold in bottles, and it's called TA-65. I don't know if you've heard about it, TA-65, but currently sold. And it's supposed to promote the health of telomeres. And uh, I, I see where what your subject matter is. And uh, Dr. Fossil, he's a medical doctor. He's got the license and whatever. He lives in California. But for you to be involved with Dr. Fossil, he says human trials are going to be on this thing to possibly treat Parkinson's disease. But apparently a month, one month supply, as far as I know, is $600 a month. And, you know, <laughs> you can afford that kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, i just like her to comment on uh, the, the use of TA-65, the health of telomeres, and aging uh, to combat them. Because we don't know too many people who are like in their 20s who have Parkinson's disease. That's why there's some logic on treating telomeres. Okay, I'm all done here with the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know very much about that drug. I haven't heard about it, but I know how telomeres work and um, they're just basically like, uh, to explain it in layman terms, you know, the things you have on the end of your shoelaces that protect it, and as they get frayed, your shoelaces get more and more frayed, so that's what your telomeres do. They prevent um, your DNA from getting damaged. And uh, anything that we can find that, so as you age, your cells keep dividing, some of them don't divide, and your telomeres just get shorter and shorter, and when your DNA gets damaged, um, there's nothing your cells can do because they're not going to divide anymore. Um, uh, there are a lot of clinical trials and a lot of drugs out there that um, that may help uh, lengthen telomeres or keep telomere length stable, but uh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> it might be interesting to look at. Yeah, great.
our favorite event. It's always good to know that we can influence a little bit of, about your projects, your research, and your lives, and your future influence into society in the future. Uh, I have a question for Carissa. Uh, I was wondering if you have come uh, throughout your research or if you have read about, uh, the, are there any differences in terms of the two mattering factors that you mentioned, interpersonal versus social, um, in terms of relationship with different populations or minorities? minority groups. I was wondering if one is more important than the other. Are they equal? Are they related? And it's a little bit of a follow-up to that. Um, any key factors that you have identified in terms of how can you intervene in th if you're starting in a path, um, especially for you, so if you're starting in a path, are there any factors, things that could influence a change in that path, um, either if you're an interpersonal or social matter. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so yes, actually, uh, so let me start by saying that most of, the, most of the literature on the interpersonal matter, or on societal mattering, is not, it's just non-existent. Um, so most of the literature on mattering has been with interpersonal mattering, but they have uh, researchers have found um, to, there to be differences between um, males and females, as well as across racial groups, um, with females reporting uh, greater perceptions of interpersonal mattering compared to males, and then um, white youth report higher perceptions of interpersonal mattering compared to uh, minority groups. Um, when it comes to societal mattering, it has not been studied, in fact, the first measure of it um, in its construct has been just developed and is just under review right now. So it's, um, I can't answer it about that, but I hypothesize that there would be differences. Um, as for factors that I, I studied in my dissertation for societal mattering, I found that youth who perceive there to be more opportunities in their communities are more likely to feel as though they matter to, their, to society. Um, same with um, youth resources, or uh, just resources in the community. So I studied rural youth, and uh, overall the perceptions of resources in the communities were very low, but those who perceived there to be more were more likely to feel as though they matter to society. Um, and then there, I also studied a couple of school factors, and so um, um, perceptions of uh, the, the support for autonomy within schools from faculty or from staff and administrators uh, had played an important role in youth's perceptions of societal mattering. Um, and then the more opportunities that youth had to be involved in decision making um, in their schools also increased their perceptions of societal mattering. When it comes to interpersonal mattering, um, these have been pretty well studied. Um, predictors of interpersonal mattering have been studied in the literature, but um, things like parental support, um, friend support, um, things like that. They've, they, and parent, I, I studied, this was the first study that looked at it, but it was um, parent-child communication quality, and that played an important role in youth's perceptions of um, interpersonal mattering. So there are definitely avenues for enhancing perceptions of mattering. Um, but I appreciate that question. Thank you so much. They're, they're right there and then here as well. This is for you. Uh, you mentioned early on in your talk about cities being chaos, and I'm not sure if you meant that as just a, a phrase or the actual theory of chaos, which is roughly constrained randomness. And I'm wondering if you've actually tried to apply that, especially with perturbations in how technology happens. I mean, you made a really good example of clothing and, and weaving, and at some point technology changed so that nobody actually has to make their own clothes unless you really want to which is a lot more effort. So it, it would be interesting to see if you can apply 
those kind of theories and adding perturbations to that and see how they affect and see how you can project that into the future? No, thank you for that question. And I, I really do mean it both in kind of the, the layman sense of chaos that, you know, they're very difficult to understand. They're kind of uh, disorderly in some way. But I do mean it in the technical sense as well, that they really are uh, systems that if you can, if you, as much as you can, a lot of cities do operate deterministically. Um, there are actually a lot of ways in which if you had perfect knowledge, you probably could predict how long a community would survive. Um, in the other hand, an individual community, you can't predict that for. Um, and of course, with any you know, any amount of uncertainty, which it's a social science, we deal only in uncertainty, we have no facts. Um, that really does mean that uh, we are, at the end of the day, unable to really predict anything in the long run. Um, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's just how, welcome, welcome to historical sciences. Um, so uh, I, I really do mean that in, in that technical sense as well. Um, and that's one thing that I actually have been working on here. Um, we have on campus the Center for Complex Systems, uh, which is a very good uh, kind of umbrella group that brings in a lot of people who work on uh, weird hard problems that started in physics and now are applied to a lot of different places and one of them is how do we understand chaotic systems um, and so that is something I think that's very fruitful for studying cities. Um, technological change is a really interesting one to study. There's lots of studies about how individual technologies build on each other and there's lots of, techno there's lots of studies on how cities radically change in their apparent appearance when, te when major technological shifts happen. So we can think about the Industrial Revolution. Um, most urban planners I know say that there's no reason to study cities before the Industrial Revolution because there's nothing in common. Um, but at the same time, technologies and the way that they're implemented are a constant through time. Um, and so you actually can, uh, you know, really build some nice models that kind of accept that technological change exists without saying that we can't learn anything from the past. So thank you for your question. I think that really, yeah, that's definitely something I'm, I'm actively working on right now. I wanted to thank all of you again, and especially commenting on the emphasis that I see on early intervention and early advancement in ideas. But I'm looking around the room here, and it's clear from looking around the room that 50 is the new 20 and 60 is the new 30. <laughs> and having a challenge for you, to look at some of the ideas that you're taking in a youth intervention and looking at them deeper out. Um, so for Cecilia, maybe something like lifelong learning and the impact of post-reproductive. For Colleen, taking that idea of the CV um, thermogenesis and the ideas of impacting that into an older community and taking that kind of movement activity and the mattering particularly, and the spirituality hit me in a, in a very interesting spot, looking at how could we translate that not only to the intervention early, but also middle to late, and especially the mattering, addressing that in the sense of older people engaging in lifelong learning, engaging in the community, and being activists for change. So thank you for that, and just a challenge for the future. So much for that. Um, there has been a little bit of research in mattering across the life span. Um, and what they found is that upon retirement, perceptions of mattering have decreased substantially. So I think you're right of um, interventions across the lifespan and how important that would be to this idea of mattering. So I appreciate that. Thank you. There's a question right here, Joe. Yeah, could you just paraphrase it as your answer? Thanks. So if I'm paraphrasing this correctly, kind of what we may not get to in our PhD um, or that's somewhat of a one-off that we would like to see where our research could go or would go. Um, so I could thank you. Um, so with my research, it's, it's very fundamental understanding of, of bioheat and how heat is transferred throughout the body. Um, but something that I would 
love to do and, and kind of have briefly done in my PhD work, which is not in my thesis, so I'm sure my advisor is not particularly happy that I've deviated. Um, but in your, in your comment about age, as we do study aged animals, but um, compounding factors such as cardiovascular disease and temperature regulation. So um, my colleague does deep vein thrombosis work and there's um, some very little literature about deep vein thrombosis and heat stress. Um, but as we have an aging population, a lot of these uh, comorbidities are becoming apparent and cardiovascular disease is the number one killer and will continue to, to be um, until we kind of understand that. So what I would really like to do is is take my research away from more of the basic fundamental science and apply, start applying it as the um, therapeutic. So uh, we face this a lot in engineering is the battle between researchers and clinicians. Um, and so how can we get things to be more science focused and not practicing of medicine, but you know, we cool patients off for a reason, but we don't know how to cool them off, what temperature to use. So actually making it more of a science um, so that we can start applying it to cardiovascular diseases and other, other diseases. So, um, Colleen and, and Cecilia, I think it's really interesting that, Colleen, you're actually looking at changing the common knowledge of how the physics work in the body, which is a backing up in terms of technology and what we understand is a lot of what Cecilia is actually looking into as well, how we perceived how the body worked, um, so what some things to, to consider when you're talking with them, but um, specifically how hard has it been for you to change the models that how the body works? I mean, it's interesting that you say, well, this is not what we thought. And I'm sure you went into your work with some models and how you thought you were going to build around them. And then when you actually me direct, do direct measurement. It's not what you expect and how you had to change it. That's a great question. I mean, I actually thought when Cecilia was talking, um, about what is it that we think right now that in, you know, hundreds of years people are going to laugh at like we did with the humors. Um, so hopefully that's not my work. Um, uh, it has been challenging. I think that with a lot of basic research, it's more of why does it matter? Like who cares? Um, particularly in the core vasculature. So these are the very large arteries and veins. Um, Mathematically, they're not thermally significant, so they're, they're too big to really be part of like the bioheat equation, so the mathematics that you would be doing at a specific tissue. So this, is, this really matters when you're doing um, heat ablation for tumors um, or you're trying to do cool therapies for neural protective mechanisms. Um, but, but my perspective is, is we need to know how the body works in a, in a holistic, whole system. Um, so I will say that, one, it's been challenging to, to say, why does this matter? Um, but I think if you go into, well, we don't just care at, at one specific tissue or one cell, we do care about whole body systems. Um, but it's been also exciting because with MRI, I actually have images, you know, MRIs, they actually produce images. And so it's a lot easier than saying, oh, we have these percent changes when I can say, here's a picture of the vessels, they get bigger. Um, and so that, that's been nice is to have that very, because um, I'm an experimentalist. And sometimes if you work in computational work, th those of us that are experimentalists would say, is that true? It goes against all these things. But as an experimentalist, I can just show the data. And that's kind of how I've really approached it is just, here it is. Um, we can't, we could be wrong in a lot of our predictions of why this is happening, but as far as that it's actually happening, the, the images are the proof. This will be our last question. Yeah. Thank you. So I also do, could see a lot of uh, overlap in what all of you were, were talking about. And I can imagine, imagine some interesting conversations over a cup of coffee and Andrew talking about how to study the past and Gordon and Carissa. But as an engineer, I'm going to ask my question to Colleen. <laughs> I would never have guessed mechanical engineering after reading what's written here. So can you, I would have expected something more medical related. So can you explain the collaboration between the departments of engineering and whoever else you work with? Because that's 
Um, yeah, I think that I should have spoken to about that is that University of Michigan provides this interdisciplinary research that, that not a lot of universities can really have because we have one of the best medical schools as well as one of the best college of engineering as well as the best, you know, everything else. Um, so actually my background is in material science and engineering um, from undergrad and then uh, I like minored in BME, so there's a lot of reasons why I haven't chosen to, to switch over to biomedical engineering, and that's because I'm a, a true believer of fundamental engineering, um, but that means nothing, so a lot of people are in, in BME, so it's just been a personal choice. Um, but as far as how I can be a mechanical engineer is, one, I, I work with a, a BME advisor, so biomedical engineering advisor, um, and that's very common, in college, at least in College of Engineering, for, for students to work Um, but the way that I see it is that I approach things like a mechanical engineer. So any kind of problem that I would see would be approached that we have these, you know, uh, normally when I'm presenting I, I throw up the heat equations, right? We have conduction, we have convection, we have radiation. Those things still apply in the body itself. So the next slide that I usually is bio heat transfer. It's still heat transfer. It just happens to be in the body and actually happens to be far more complex. Um, so I just think that I like look at problems as a mechanical engineer um, as opposed to, to a different discipline. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for attending our event today and let's take a final moment to thank our panelists. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your time at the University of Michigan.